At the beginning of our United Methodist hymnal, in the opening pages, we find John Wesley's directions for singing. These seven rules were first included in a hymn book for early Methodists in 1761, entitled Select Hymns. And these rules were designed to instruct the people that are called Methodists and how they should sing hymns during worship. John Wesley came up with these rules in a time when most of these, what we would call old traditional hymns, were actually brand new songs. His brother Charles had written several uh, hymns, and most of them would never end up being sung in a church building during Wesley's time. To give you a point of reference, John Newton's famous hymn, Amazing Grace, hadn't even been written yet at this point. It wouldn't be written until 1779. Early in the Methodist movement, John and Charles, along with their preachers, were forced to preach out in the open air because they were rarely welcomed to preach behind Anglican pulpits. So preachers would lead these hymns from this hymn book without piano or organ. They would sing one line at a time, and then the gathered crowd would repeat what they had heard. And apparently, George Whitfield, a good friend of John and Charles, was a master at leading these hymns after he finished preaching. John and Charles' father, Samuel, had also written poetry, and you can see that they might have been influenced by some of his work. They had a clear love for hymns, and they believed that worship was a way to unite the community of believers. And these seven rules were a way to encourage participation in worship from all people. So join us today on the podcast as we explore John Wesley's Directions for Singing. Hello and welcome to the Methodical Methodist Podcast, a podcast where we talk about why the church is still relevant for us today as we explore themes connected to religion, politics, pop culture, faith, and yes, even the church. Together we can find out what it means to live into the mission of the church by making disciples. Now, let's get methodical. Hello everyone, I am your host, the Reverend Andrew Lay, and I am excited to spend this time on the podcast today. If you like the show, hope that you might take a minute to subscribe, rate, and write a review for the podcast. It helps to boost the show and make it to where more people can find it. You can also find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash methodicalpod, and you can find me on Instagram as well. My handle is at methodicalpod, so be sure to check me out. All right, so let's jump into today's episode. I'm excited because today on the podcast, we have organist and church musician Joshua Bracken to help me talk through each of these rules. I've known Josh for several years now. His father actually used to be my parents' pastor, and I quickly became friends with Josh and his dad, Tim, and I thought about doing this podcast, and as I thought about that, I knew that I had to have Josh join me in the discussion um, because he is just uh, so full of knowledge on, on this subject. But first, as we officially begin this episode, we're going to listen to Josh play a little bit of organ for us. Josh Bracken, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Ah, it's my pleasure to be here with you. All right. Well, before we jump in, I wonder if you might share a little bit about uh, your background with music. How did you first get interested in learning how to play the organ? And what first drew you to that instrument and church music in general? Um, well, it first started uh, when... Um, we moved to Johnson City. My dad is United Methodist pastor as well in the Holston Conference. So we had moved from Greenville, Tennessee to uh, First United Methodist in Johnson City, Tennessee. Um, and this was the first church that had a pop organ in it that I had actually seen. Um, so I, I heard it and then we had gone to a class reunion uh, with my parents and the organ there and 
um, Asbury's University's chapel um, uh, was playing, and I was uh, this big piece, and I was like, I've got to learn how to play this instrument. Um, so when we got back from that, um, our organist choir director had gone overseas for a week. Um, so I thought this is the perfect opportunity for me to sneak in the sanctuary and turn it on and, and see if I can do this. Um, I, I had had uh, very little piano lessons before uh, that encounter with the organ. Um, so I turned it on and being a good Methodist as I am, <laughs> I turned to the first hymn in the hymnal, which is Oh, Four Thousand Tongues to Sing. Um, and just started playing. Um, I started with my hands first and then uh, moved, and then I was like, oh, I can do this. This is just like playing the piano, but a little bit different. Um, so then I was like, okay, now I'm gonna add my feet to it and see if I can play the pedal part while I'm playing uh, with my hands. And it just came natural to me. And um, right after that, it wasn't, but two months before I started taking organ lessons. Um, and um, that's, that's really just what got me, got me started with, with organ. Um, with church music, it is, it, it's been there since the beginning, since the beginning of my life. Um, my dad would always play uh, Christmas carols from King's College at Christmas time when it was, uh, time to listen to carols. Uh, we would listen to um, all sorts of different genres of church music. Um, uh, but then also my, my grandparents were heavily, uh, they were avid classical music listeners. Hmm. Uh, so classical music gets its roots from church music, um, from um, the early, early church. Um, so it just kind of progressed with me and I, I took it on and, um, and here we are today. <laughs> um, never look back. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it just kind of fell into my lap and it just was natural to me. It just to, felt like it was, um, it was supposed to be a part of my life. So when you first saw the organ, was it like, seeing it for the first time or hearing it live for the first time? What was it that I think kind of initially made you like, Oh, that I, I need to try that. Um, I, th I think it really all goes back to when I, when I was really little, um, we had a Canadian brass CD, which is an all brass um, ensemble. And they would, uh, and at the end of one of the CDs that they had, they had the Hallelujah Chorus by mm -hmm. uh, uh, George Frederick Handel. Um, and there was a, it was brass and organ. And I would be on my knees at the couch trying to play along <laughs> with, the organ, with the organ part. So there, there's always kind of this... Hmm umph and this feeling there, but it wasn't until I had been exposed to it um, in real life in real, and, and in person. Um, we had gone to Asbury for reunions, but I was still, I was not old enough to appreciate it at the, mm -hmm. at the time. Um, we had been overseas and seen uh, some of the great cathedrals in England and just, I was just not old enough to, to completely understand what was before me yeah uh, it was that combination of moving to a church that had an instrument had an organ in it and then going to reunion um and hearing uh whom would be my future organ professor um play this instrument and um it was just the right song and i was at the right place at the right time yeah that's awesome yeah. it all kind of came together and so obviously you have a uh, passion not just for the organ but for music in general and, and for church music specifically um so tell me because you know you sat down at that organ the first time you started playing you started taking lessons it progressed from there and then you ultimately made the decision that that's what you wanted to do with your life was you wanted to pursue 
church music. And so tell me a little bit about your educational background uh, that you have in music. And where did you study? What did you study specifically? And then maybe share what were some of the big insights that you gained during that time in school that maybe changed your perspective or your understanding of church music? So I attended Asbury University um, in Wilmore, Kentucky. Um, this is about 15 to 20 minutes southwest of Lexington. Um, it's literally in the middle of a horse field, of a horse pasture. Um, <laughs> and I majored in music with an emphasis in church music and organ was my instrument. Um, while I was there, um, I had to do some church visiting as with with my major with the church music emphasis and I had to go to several um churches through in the area in the lexington area and then in uh i even went up to louisville and to cincinnati to some churches there um the insight that i i got there was it music has a lot a lot to do with our worship um music can be a very bad thing for our worship as well um but it can also be very good um we had we had to do chapel three times a week um monday wednesday friday at 10 a.m most of those chapels were contemporary music um, and it was not very good contemporary music. It was not done very well. Um, so during that time, it kind of, it put a bitter taste in my mouth for contemporary music because that's all I was hearing and that's all I was exposed to. Um, and then we had, I had gone to um, South East, uh, which is a huge mega church outside of Louisville, um, where Kyle Ottoman is an associate pastor at. Um, and there, they had a professional contemporary band. Um, so it, it, it changed my thought on like, okay, this can be done in the right, in, in a good and in a musical way. Um, and then also it uh, brought to me that uh, all, all different denominations have something to offer. Uh, while I was there, I played for a Presbyterian church. I played for an Episcopal church, um, went to several uh, masses while I was there. I even attended an Orthodox church one Saturday. Um, that two and a half hours was enough. <laughs> um, um, so it it really brought to my attention that there there's a lot of good that other denominations can offer, and we shouldn't shun it from our own worship experience because it has the Presbyterian name on it, or it has the Episcopal name on it, or whatever flavor you want to uh, put on it. Um, and then after I graduated from Asbury, I went to Lee University where I obtained my master's in music and worship. Um, this was um, a two year degree turned into four, um, <laughs> as it goes sometimes. Um, Probably the biggest insight that I learned from uh, from that was a lot of times Protestants and evangelicals tend to forget about the Holy Spirit. Um, Lee being a Church of God institution and affiliated with the Church of God denomination, um, 
the Holy Spirit is very prevalent at is as is a part of their of their framework and and it and it brought to my attention that in a lot of of the United Methodist churches that I've been to um it's the Father and the Son, and we just kind of forget about the Holy Spirit. Um, so it, it it made me very aware to always be thinking about there's another member of the Trinity, and that um, I mean God sent His Spirit for a reason. So I mean we need we need to be using it and and it's here and it's a gift and we just we seem to just forget about the spirit um and then it just it also um i dived deeper into uh into church music history and and just stuff like that and and just really how all the music that we have today we can trace back to early church um, music composers um, and everybody is built um, on top of one another. Right. Yeah. Awesome. I, I think um, I'm really glad that you're on this episode today because I think you're going to provide a lot of the knowledge and a, an authoritative voice that I might not be able to really offer. Um, as we kind of talk about John Wesley's directions for singing mm -hmm. and uh and we have those at the beginning of our united methodist hymnals um but there at the very top john wesley uh, even prefaces his directions for singing by saying this that this part of divine worship may be the more acceptable to god as well as the more profitable to yourself and others be careful to observe the following directions so just right off the bat, I mean, just even in the preface, John is, is, I think he's really talking about how important not only music is, but, but music in the setting of worship. He refers mm -hmm. to it as divine worship. And he really makes that point that, that our worship should be acceptable to God and profitable to ourselves and others. Mm -hmm. So, yes. um, Josh, what do you think about that rule? And, and what do you think that um, music and hymns, how do those play a role in our worship? Um, first, I think it's important to uh, set up a definition for uh, worship. Um, I, I meant to try to find the book, but it's somewhere deep in the storage unit somewhere and I couldn't I couldn't get to it um but Robert Weber um who was the founder of the worship institute um defined worship and this is very broad and and kind of half done um but basically his definition of worship is an act that happens 24/7 in um, in choosing or a chosen God with a big G or God with a little G. Mm. So with him saying that worship is a 24 hour, seven days a week act. It's just sometimes our direction of what we're worshiping changes. Right. Sometimes we worship our phones. Sometimes we worship our schoolwork. Sometimes we worship a book. It, sometimes we worship our families. It's just we choose what God or little g gods we put into that place. But typically when we come in on Sunday morning or Wednesday night or whenever we come to church, we're thinking about God. So... Um, with that being said, it's also it's very important that we that we remember and that we are aware that we are worshiping all the time, even in our sleep, we are still worshiping. Um, so we have to be aware of if we're spending too much time with 
on our phone mm -hmm. or and when we should be doing something to help better our relationship with Jesus. Um, but we're all humans and we all fail at that right. at some point or another during the week. Sometimes it's just, we have to put on the television and numb our mind. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it, just, it just has to happen. Um, um, so and I don't think there's anything wrong with us changing our attention from God to something else. Right. It's just, we need to be aware to get back to it. Um, so now that we have that definition, um, music and hymns, I'm going to lump that in the same category. Yeah. We're just, just going to call it music. Um, it'll get tedious for me to say music and hymns, <laughs> um, for the next sure. however long. Um, so music in in worship is a very effective um and it's also very dangerous mm -hmm. um how it's effective is is that music is a cross cultural um world language that everyone understands um you may not you may not like certain styles or certain genres, but you understand it. Right. And it does something inside of you. Um, it, it makes you feel good. It makes you feel sad. It makes you feel angry. Um, a lot of times when we get into certain um, moods in our life or um, if something has happened to us, we typically, the first thing that we turn to is music. Mm -hmm. Um, a song that might lift us up or um, occasionally I'll listen to um, songs that I knew that my grandparents loved. Um, and, and I'll remember my grandparents through those, through those songs yeah. um, or, you know, it's a, it's a nice summer night and, you know, I just want to go drive with the windows down and we're going to turn on some Alan Jackson. Um, <laughs> there, there's some sort of, it does something to us. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's emotive. Um, so in the church, it does the same thing. Um, when we, when we have um, a special music slot or a prelude or an offertory or an anthem piece, or even a hymn, um, the, the music will move us. Um, the sounds of the organ or the piano or the choir, it, 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 it drives that emotion in us. And, um, and it can be very helpful for, um, to getting a response. Right. Or say, um, from, your congregation um, or, or a visitor, you know, a visitor may come in and say, I've not heard this in a long time. And then just starts crying. Yeah. Then that they've, they've uh, been out of church for a long time and it just, it brings them back. Um, Gosh, you know, I, because I, I can't, I can't tell you, tell you how many times somebody said, Oh, that song takes me back to when I was a kid. It kind yeah. of transports them to a different time. Or I've even seen folks say, I can't even listen to that hymn right now because that was my yeah. husband who just passed away, you know, right. his favorite hymn growing up. And uh, I think you're absolutely right. It's such an emotion. It can be such mm -hmm. an emotional thing. Um, and, and I think even – for some reason, when you have those memories of the past, especially if you've grown up in church, it's a very, very strong feeling. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very, yeah. very strong emotion that you feel. And then how it can, how it can be um, dangerous is, is that we can, we can use those emotions to manipulate people. Yeah. We emotionally manipulate them into um, coming down to the to the kneeling rail or um potentially giving more money or creating an experience that's built on emotion and not truth right 
Um, so, and that's, and that's where it can be, can be dangerous. Um, if you go back and you look at the, at the early church and in the new Testament, um, music was hardly ever, ever a part of their, of their service. Mm -hmm. Um, it was scripture praying and maybe preaching on the, on the word, but it was primarily prayer and reading of the word. A uh, part of that is because they were uh, persecuted, so they couldn't be singing in their houses. Otherwise, somebody would come and find them. Um, but it, it's I've I've always wanted to to do a a worship service with no music hmm. because we don't we don't have to have it to worship. Right. Um, it helps but we don't have to have it. So hopefully one day I'll get to, I'll get to do that and probably get a lot of complaints. Oh, we didn't have, we didn't have yeah. this today. We didn't. Uh, yeah. And, um, yeah. So, but it's, it's also a good teaching moment as well. So I can see that being a, a good, um, good Friday service. Yes. Uh, yes. To yeah. Really just, um, uh, particularly because I think in the past I, I've used that service, um, to really be focused on the, on the word, on the scripture. Mm -hmm. And, and I can see how that could really uplift the scripture, maybe in a new way where folks haven't heard it before, especially if there's not music there. Um, that, that's right. the only thing you're really hearing is that word. So that, yeah, that's, I think that's an awesome idea. You're right though. I think folks would be like, this is a little strange. This is a little weird. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So no, um, thank you for offering that. Um, definition from Robert Weber. Um, I've, I've read a few of his books. I've read one, uh, Worship is a Verb, which I found yep. very helpful mm -hmm. in kind of how I view worship. Um, but I think that's a great preface for us as we jump into these rules uh, yep. to think about as well, to keep that in the back of our mind, that, that music is not in its own essence worship, but it, it is something that enhances or can enhance mm -hmm. our worship. Um, so let's just kind of jump into, into John's rules. Uh, the first rule, learn these tunes before you learn any others. Afterwards, learn as many as you please. And first of all, I just want to say, I love that he says the word tunes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Love these tunes, yeah. not, not hymns, not songs, but tunes. Yeah. And then he's, you know, I, I think Wesley though is, is really trying to build up a repertoire of music within the Methodist connection. And, and again, John's very methodical in how he's, he does things, mm -hmm. but I, I get the sense that he's really trying to create uniformity so that these songs can be sung in various places within the Methodist movement. And of course, Charles, is, his brother, had been writing many of these songs. So the theology is there. The theology is backing up what John and Charles and the other preachers are preaching. But mm -hmm. um, in, in thinking about this rule to, to kind of learn these tunes first, um, how do you see our hymnal today functioning? And in what ways do you think that we might get this rule right? And, and what ways maybe have we fallen short as an overall church? And maybe you can even talk about our, our current hymnal right now. And in, in what ways is it, is it, is it good and spot on? And what, what ways do you see maybe a deficiency there? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's funny, as you said earlier, this, uh, these rules were first published in seven, in 1761. Um, in, in, I can't remember the hymn title, but um, I had looked up the index for that hymnal mm. and none of Charles Wesley's two texts were in that hymnal. Wow, really? None of his brother's texts were in were in the hymnal that these rules were published in. <laughs> Which is really it's really kind of funny. He's got more Isaac Watts, who was a um, John uh, Charles and Isaac were contemporaries. Um, so he's got more of a more oh. Isaac, Isaac was more reformed um, than, than the Wesleys were. So um, he's got somebody who's a little bit 
more to the point, a little bit more strict um, than the Wesleys would have been. Uh, so I just, I just found that very funny that none of his brother's texts were in the, in that first hymnal that this, that these rules were published in. That, that, um, very, that's very surprising that, uh, yeah. Interesting. Um, so how, how our, our hymn, our hymnal is, uh, functioning very differently today as it did even 20 years ago. Um, with all of the modern technology and everything, um, with, uh, projectors and television screens, um, it's easy just to slap those words up on the wall mm -hmm. and, um, not ever have to buy another hymnal again. Um, so it's, it are the, the, the role of the hymnal in the modern day church is almost going extinct yeah i would i would say um just because one they're expensive to replace um and nobody especially some of these smaller churches they don't have enough money to buy brand new hymnals when a new hymnal comes out so they just keep the same one or they buy um it's cheaper to go and buy a television screen and uh, um um, oh, um the the a disc and and plug it in into the computer yeah. an external disc plug it into the computer and um and the words are on the screen that's a lot cheaper than spending 20 plus thousand dollars on new hymnals yeah. um so that's that's how it's changing um I don't, I don't overly like to see it happening that way because um, I've been one of those people that I like to read the music mm -hmm. um, yeah. and I like to hold the book. Um, so for, for me, I would like to see it go back yeah. to the way it was, but I know that that, ultimately can't really happen just because of technology and expenses and everything. Um, mm. So it's, it, and it also in five years, it could change. It yeah. could, the, the, the hymnal could function completely different five years from now. We just, it's, it's just always changing um, so much. Um, in, in, some of the ways that, that we have gotten it right um, is that our hymnal, the, the one that was published in 1982 something, whatever the, the current hymnal yeah. when it was published, um, that hymnal has more Charles Wesley texts than any other hymnal uh, in print right now. Wow. Um, so that I think that's one thing that we have, that, that art, that the United Methodist church as a whole has gotten, um, correct. I think where we have fallen short, where the United Methodist church has fallen short as far as this hymnal is they didn't put enough in there. Yeah. Um, if you go and you look the advent section and the Lent section are the two shortest portions of the hymnal. They have the least amount of hymns um, right. with season. Um, and that's, that's kind of sad. I mean, cause you can, I mean, Lent uh, Advent is, is four Sundays and really, you know, Christmas is two Sundays after, after the 25th mm -hmm. really we're supposed to be singing all this all the hymns that we sing during advent after, yeah. <laughs> after christmas but because we don't have uh, uh, maybe three advent hymns i know there's more than that but they're o come o come emmanuel and come that long expected jesus are are about it as far as what 
right. a normal church would know. Um, so that that's where we have fallen short um, with with our hymnal. Also, um, putting it into the context of of the time of when John Wesley would have written these, um, they hymnals were were little pocket sized books that people had and they took home with them. So they would have these families that would take their hymnal, their, their father would stick it in his coat pocket, take it home. And then they would, they would sing Mm. the hymnals at sing the hymns at their house. Right. Um, So I think also when he's talking about tunes, he's, he's trying to, to teach them their faith because when we sing, when we sing our hymns, we're singing our faith. Right. And so, I mean, we can, we can sit here and just say, hark the herald angel sings glory to the newborn King. That's, that's not, that's not going to potentially stick with us. But when we, when we put it to a melody, we're going to, we're going to be able to remember it more. You're going to go hark the herald angel sings. You've got, you've got a tune associated with right. the words just like when you learn your abcs um it just it just helps so that's i think why he was saying learn these tunes because you got to have the tune in order to sing the text right so yeah well i think well said absolutely i i think you're spot on uh, about uh, where where there's some imp- room for improvement on the hymnal too. I, I think that's a good point. I hadn't thought about it that way, but you're absolutely right. Um, John's second rule is, is seeing them exactly as they are printed here without altering or mending them at all. And if you have learned uh, to sing them otherwise, unlearn it <laughs> as soon as you can. Uh, I love that kind of that last bit of shade there at the end. Um, <laughs> So that, yeah, that's just that's a very John statement. I think, um, I think I think this one could be a, a tough one for for today's society. Um, you know, I serve a church where I, I predominantly preach in the contemporary worship service, and uh, we break that rule all the time. Um, you know, I, I, we hear that we hear that done all the time. I, I've, I've heard composers even. Um, <coughs> write various traditional variations and mm-hmm. styles of some of these hymns. Um, do you think this is a good rule? Do you think this is a rule that we could create some room for our current context with? Or, or do you think this is what, what John was really meaning? What, what do you kind of make of this, of this rule? Um, well, I can't really speak to the contemporary side of it. So I'm just going to speak to, to what sure, I know. Sure. Um, I think this, this goes back also to rule number one, where he's trying to create uniformity, right? He's trying to get everybody to sing the same way, sing uh, the rhythms the same way. So not, so somebody's not doing something different or whatever. Um, one of and I'll, and I'll play you some examples in a second of, of where different congregations do this today yeah. still. Um, but for me, if I'm, if I'm um, playing the organ for a congregation, I'm going to stick to what is written on the page. Right. Um, I'm going to play it exactly how it's written 99.9% of the time. Um, just because that's what the people are looking at, that's what they're seeing, mm-hmm. whether they they say they can or cannot read music, everybody can read a little bit of music. Everybody knows when it goes up and then it, when it goes down. Right. Um, everybody knows that the black notes are shorter than the white notes. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is, I think he's just trying to, get everybody on the same page right. and to not do anything different. Um, one of the biggest um, 
I think one of the biggest ones that we do today, as far as not singing them how it's how it's written in the hymnal, uh, comes from "Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee." Mm. Um, this was a tune that Beethoven had written um, before John and Charles got on the scene, um, and this hymn came from the fourth movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Um, so in its set to joyful, joyful, we adore thee. And that's the tune is hymn to joy. But later on, it's, it goes like this. That's how it's written. A lot of times it's played like this. So, um, and that's, that's called syncopation when you have the, um, so it's syncopated in, in, um, a lot of times to make it easier, we just, we just play it straight to where we take the syncopation out of it. And it's not how Beethoven intended it to be. Mm -hmm. Um, another example is um how great thou art um it's printed on our hymnal this way everybody in the world sings it like this and that's not how it's printed in our hymnal Right. So I will be playing How Great Thou Art, and everybody will be doing it the way that it's not printed in the hymnal. And I'm sitting up there playing it the way that it is printed in the hymnal. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, it's more so just trying to create a uniformity and keep everybody on the same page. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you, I don't get the sense that John was writing this thinking that in the year 2020, people would look at these rules and think, oh, maybe we shouldn't think <laughs> yeah. a song a little differently now. You know, yeah. uh, I'm sure he wasn't envisioning that rule being something that we would be looking at in this way mm -hmm. uh, this much, you know, um, later in life. But anyway, I, I think that's a great explanation just to keep folks on the same page. Mm -hmm. Literally, the the, <laughs> wait, what was that? Literally and figuratively. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, the third rule is sing all. See that you join with the congregation as frequently as you can. Let not a slight degree of weakness or weariness hinder you. If it is a cross to you, take it up and you will find a blessing. I beautiful. Um, Again, I think I think Wesley is really pointing to that communal aspect of singing and engaging in worship. And he really endorses this idea of singing together as a congregation as often as you can. Um, you know, I know that you are up in the in the chancel with the choir most Sundays in your church playing the organ. Um, but do maybe not currently because of the coronavirus, <laughs> but uh do you think that this is still a mark of a good Methodist, everyone singing together? I think it's just a, a good mark of a Christian. Hmm. Um, I, I think I, we, should, we should be singing together all the time. Obviously not right now, but when we, but when we can, um, you know, we should just – just sing. I mean, singing all, especially together, it does something to us. Um, there, there have been studies that have that have proven like choirs when they're when they're together a lot and they're and they're singing. Uh, when they sing, their heartbeats align. Wow. So everybody has got the same heartbeat while they are singing together. Um, which is very fascinating, and 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 it's so, and it's something it's that unites us together. We all are having, we all have the same pulse. 
Um, now that's that's probably more for more of these groups that are s rehearsing every day. So like these uh, performing choirs that that that's their job. Um, but there but there is also this. Uh, this feeling that you're singing in this room with with 200 plus people aging from 95 to 16 and mm -hmm. you're all coming together and lifting your voices as one uh there's something powerful in that um every every year except for this year um i go to asbury for their reunions and i play for their hymn sing um it is one of the best experiences that i have ever had as far as as him singing because everybody is singing and everybody is singing loud yeah and um it it just blows the roof off when you get people who like to sing and know how to sing and they're singing their parts and all this other stuff it's just it's an amazing experience um i think we have kind of um gotten away from that uh we we've said it's okay if you don't sing the hymns um or or you know there are people that say that they're tone deaf and they won't sing uh, because they don't feel like that they're that they're making good music, um, or there's just people that just they just don't like to sing, and yeah. you know you can't really help that. You can you can try and try and try to try to change that, um, and you know it may take 15 years before they even open up their hymnal. But you know you got to try. You got to try yeah. to get try to get them to sing. Um, so not not just a mark of a good methodist but a mark of a good christian absolutely uh, yeah that that kind of leads us into john's next role which yep. is sing lustily and with good courage beware of singing as if you were half dead or half asleep um I, that may depend on how the preacher's doing that's <laughs> the name of it. um but lift up your voice with strength be no more afraid of your voice now nor more ashamed of its being heard than you, when you sing the songs of Satan. Um, I love I love a couple things in the way he he frames this this point. Um, I love that he says, you know, sing lustily with good courage. But I love that he also says, don't be afraid of your voice or ashamed of your voice being heard. And I think that's one thing that really holds a lot of people. Back. back yep um they just don't want other they're self-conscious they don't want other people to hear them singing and and john i think is addressing that fear that people experienced even back then mm -hmm. um that, that i think people are experiencing today but he says don't be ashamed of your voice being heard then when you sung the songs of satan <laughs> and then my initial thought was like i think there are people who are coming to church that are not singing hymns in church, but they're probably singing in the shower that morning with no problem. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and, and I don't know if you want to address what Wesley meant by the songs of Satan, but um, I, I get the sense that, you know, there are people out there who can sing along to the radio, but for some reason, when they're in a place where other people mm -hmm. are around, around them, they kind of clam up. Right. Um, I'll, I'll propose this question to you and to the listeners. Um, when you're when you're driving and you've got your contemporary Christian music on or or Christian music on and your windows are down and it's loud, and somebody pulls up next to you with your with their windows down as well, what do you do? Do you turn the volume down or do you turn it back up? Or do you turn it up even farther so they can hear what you're listening to? I would say nine times out of ten, most people turn their music down if yeah. it's Christian music. If they're listening to the Red Hot Chili Peppers, 
Alan Jackson, ACDC, some of these other people that are that everybody kind of listens to, um, chances are they're not, it's not going to be turned down. It's going to stay the same volume that it was. Um, I, I kind of think that's a more modern take on singing the songs of Satan. Um, I, and I also thought about this um, this week as well. Um, and don't don't hate me and, and, and <laughs> this other stuff. But. And I'm not saying that Rocky Top is the song of Satan. <laughs> uh, because it's not. Um, hit, the, the point to this is, is that you need to be singing Rocky Top. You need to be singing your hymns or your contempor- or your your Christian music just as loud as you would sing Rocky Top on a Saturday night right. or Saturday afternoon. They they need to be equal. You need to be doing both of them at the same oomph. But also you should be doing the hymns and the contemporary in the in the Christian music more. Um yeah. more with more oomph because it's God and it's, yeah, it's God. I mean, <laughs> it's God. Yeah. yeah. So, um, that, that's, that's kind of what I, what I take on that as far as seeing the songs of, of Satan, there was something else I was going to say, but I, I, I completely forgotten, but yeah, you don't get the sense that John is accusing anybody of singing songs to worship Satan. Yeah. It's really just this idea of, of these secular songs. Correct. Yes. You're singing these secular songs on your own in the shower at home. Like, you know, yeah. you know, you need to be singing the hymns too. You can do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it's kind of a way, maybe it's a way to kind of ease folks tensions uh, mm-hmm. about that. Yeah. Um, you know, the next rule is kind of an interesting one. He says, sing modestly. So, so you know, the last one, it's sing lustily. And then he, he, he turns around and says, well, also sing modestly. Do not bawl so as to be heard above or distinct from the rest of the congregation. <laughs> um, we don't, I don't know if we have that problem a lot in churches today, but I'm sure it happens. Yep. Uh, uh, and he says, don't do this, that you may not destroy the harmony but strive to unite your voices together so as to make one clear melodious sound. Mm. So maybe this is Wesley's polite way of saying, saying sing well. And if you can't sing well, make sure you're not singing over everybody else. (laughs) Kind of be in the mix, be, be united in this. Um, So what do you think of this rule? Um, So I think four and five, they go together. Um, I think he should have put five in the four spot and four in the five spot. (laughs) Um, Because I think what he's saying here is that for the people that are classically trained or they're trained in music, they're going to be the ones who are going to try to sing above everyone else. Mm -hmm. Um, Or the people that, that like their voice and they're not afraid to sing they're going to they're going to sing louder than than everyone else uh so this is where four and five kind of go together because you have to teach your congregation to sing the same right and then then you have to try to figure out how to if there's somebody that comes in that's that's singing louder than everyone else then fix it a lot of times I can't hear that from from where I from where I am at the organ just because the sound hits me somewhat before it hits the congregation. Um, but I can I can hear and um, it's it's very interesting. Sometimes I can I can hear somebody in the back on the opposite side of, of me just because of the acoustics in the room and everything. Um, so with, with rule five, he's really, I think the point is he's really trying to make is that if you're, if you're an alto singer, 
don't sing your part louder than the melody. Right. Make it fit. Um, if, if you were, if uh, I know that you were in band and, and one of the things that they always tell you is to uh, listen to the lowest instrument to balance to the tubas. Um, right. So that's, he's trying to, trying to say we need to, we need to balance our voices so that we all sound as one. It all, it all comes back to that um, uniformity and that we're trying to be one voice um, in one church. Yeah. Yeah. I, I see that common theme throughout all of these really. Yeah. Um, we, we see it in rule six, sing in time, huh. whatever time is sung, be sure to keep with it. Do not run before nor stay behind, but attend closely to the leading voices and move therewith as exactly as you can. And take care you sing not too slow. This drawing way naturally steals on all who are lazy. <laughs> <laughs> it is high time to drive it out from, from among us and sing all our tunes just as quick as we did at first. Um, <laughs> you know, when, I, when I'm looking at, at these rules, and this one specifically, I get the sense that John has some specific people in mind <laughs> that he may be writing these rules for. Yeah. Like, maybe he's had some experiences mm. leading some hymns, and he's just heard folks sing out of time or ball, as yeah. he called, sing too modestly. I think, I think he's, he's writing these really out of his own experience and what he's seen taking place in, in, mm -hmm. the, in the movement. Yeah. Um, but again, it's, it's going, it's going back to sing and sing well, <laughs> like yeah. stay united, stay along with everybody mm -hmm. else. Yeah. Sure. And it's just also, he might've had experiences with, um, bad organists that <laughs> their, that their tempos were too slow for him. Um, so I think, uh, um, a lot of people have a, a sour taste when it comes to traditional music in the church, uh, because they always think about um, Grandma Betty up at the organ playing super slow, and and kids don't. That's that's all they that's all they think, and that's all they can that's all they can picture, and um, and that's and that's hurt the church. Um, our, our hymns, even even if they're a little supposed to be more on the meditative side, um, I will always try to play it just a little bit faster than it's supposed to. Um, especially if you've got a lot of people, then you have to play it faster. Otherwise, it'll just like keep slowing down after after every stanza. It'll just keep slowing down. So it's it's. And also is keeping the congregation awake. Right. Um, it's keep, keeping them engaged. Um, it's going to be very hard to sing all five stanzas of And Can It Be if it's going at the pace of a turtle. <laughs> right, yeah. I would last 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and can it be over is what and, people... Yes, exactly. <laughs> Yes, and everybody will say amen when it's over. It's that <laughs> <low>. <laughs> I love it. Well, we're, we're finally at John's uh, seventh rule. Uh, uh, above all, sing spiritually. Have an eye to God in every word you sing. Aim at pleasing him more than yourself or any other creature. In order to this, attend strictly to the sense of what you sing and see that your heart is not carried away with the sound, but offered to God continually. Mm -hmm. So shall your singing be such as the Lord will approve of here and rewarded when he cometh in the clouds of heaven. I, I think this is the rule that really grounds all the other rules and, mm -hmm. and, and takes us back again to that preface of divine worship. Um, this is really my favorite rule out of all of them because it's that reminder right. yes. that, that singing is the truest form of of what worship is about. Mm -hmm. it, it encompasses and embodies yes. um, mm -hmm. what worship is. So, Josh, how how does this rule 
speak to you and, and how do you view Wesley's rules in general? Um, this, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, you know, we started off in rule one about learn these tunes. And then in this rule, above all sing spiritually, have an eye, eye to God in every word you sing. So now we've, we've somehow moved to words through mm -hmm. these seven rules through with this, with this rule. Um, did this also would probably be my favorite rule. Um, other than the, um, some other words is, um, from six when it says the this drawing way naturally steals on all who are lazy. <laughs> There's just some, <laughs> some jabs that John, that John puts in there. Um, but this rule, this rule speaks to me probably uh, differently than it does other, uh, uh, other people. Uh, just because what I, what I get out of this is that it is my job as a future music minister, choir director to teach the words of the hymns to the congregation. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times people just don't really know or understand what they're singing. Right. Um, and there's so much theology just in our, just in the first hundred pages of our hymnal. Um, like when you start right at oh four thousand tongues and then go to the first one hundred hymns, there's so much theology that needs to be unpacked and and uh, stuff that we just don't that are hidden in, in the text that that we might one be pronouncing wrong um, mm -hmm. or um, we might not know what an Ebenezer is. Uh, so stuff it's there, there is stuff like that, that is important, um, for me as a church leader to teach, um, as church music leader to teach the congregation what they're singing and so that they understand, um, so that they can aim at pleasing him and pleasing God. Because as I said earlier, you want to have um your foundation be on on, on truth and not right. emotion uh truth is stable emotions are not emotions are like building your house on the sand the truth is like building your house on the rock um so that's how it speaks to me and and you know the the if you if you teach people what they're seeing they're more likely to to think about it when they leave the church, when they leave church, or they might be more inclined to take a hymnal home with them and study it uh, throughout the week. Um, I could go on and on and on about that um, <laughs> and tell a lot of stories, but but I won't. Um, I'll jump down to the end of end of that rule. Um, is that how we should be offering it to God? continually um i think i think god gets joy in in even seeing seeing us and hearing us sing the songs of quote unquote satan um singing secular music because god still made it god still created it um it's not it's not um when you take texts out of modern day songs, it be, it's sacred music. It only becomes secular when you add words to it. Um, so I don't, I honestly don't think God has an issue with, um, with us singing some of the songs. Now there are songs out there that have cuss words every, every word and they have a bad message and stuff like that, that's probably not going to be acceptable to God. Um, but I'm also not God. So I can't speak on that. Um, <laughs> sure. So, um, so we sing in such a way that, that God will approve of us here. And then, you know, when we get to heaven and we're singing with, with everybody, with, 
all the saints that have gone before us and we'll have all the same volume of voices that is going to be an amazing experience um when bach is sitting down at the organ and um just playing for us and we're singing with him and Charles and Isaacs are, uh, are are up there leading leading the music and everything. I mean, it's it's going to be uh, something spectacular. So we need to make sure that we're practice practicing it correctly here before right. we before we join the the heavenly choir. And I think that's also something that John is trying to to teach us is that these are also practicing guidelines on how we're supposed to how we're going to be expected to sing when we get to heaven. Yeah. Um, so um, I think, I think these rules um, are kind of forgotten about uh, mm-hmm. people forget that that's like right after all the, the publishing stuff um, and after the preface, the preface preface it's, the third the third page in the hymnal right. um is for these for these rules um so yeah yeah they're they're, they're they need to be taught more <laughs> yeah yeah and and that kind of leads me to, to a question i wanted to and i don't want to put you on the spot but um if you could add any of your own rules to to john's rules um, what would they be? You know, I know that you, you're an organist, you've led worship, you've heard choirs, you've heard the congregation. So, um, do you have any of your own rules that you think maybe John forgot about or should have added? Don't complain if your organist is playing too loud. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, get, I get that a lot. Um, mm. but also what I, and I say that, um, jokingly and very seriously um is that it's always it's it's better to play just a little bit louder than what the congregation is singing because um it gives those people who are uh, self-conscious about their voice to sing right Um, it gives it gives those people that opportunity because oh if the organ is playing a little bit louder then chances are the person in front of me is not going to hear me sing. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that would be my rule and my expl- explanation to, to my rule. <laughs> yeah. Good rule. I like it. Awesome. Yeah. Good deal. So um, I thought, you know, we've gone through John's directions for singing. I thought it might be fun to kind of ro- uh, wrap up this episode by talking about our top five favorite <laughs> hymns and maybe what you like about them. Um, I, I had kind of given you a warning about this question earlier this week and, <laughs> and you said, Oh my gosh, this is going to be a tough one. Yeah. Um, and initially I was just going to ask you, but you kind of said, no, if I'm going to do this, you have to too. Yeah. Uh, so how do you want to do this? Do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? Uh, do you, do let's we go the same. Same let's time. let's go at the same time. We'll do okay. I'll do one and then you do and then you do one. Um, okay. So top uh, my number five. Should we go? Should we go five to one or one to five? Let's go five to one. Okay. Then you go first because I have to remember what I said. What I <laughs> what I had what I had what my list was. I should have written it down, but I didn't. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So. Um, my top number five uh, is for the beauty of the earth. Okay. Cause I think it's just a solid hymn. Like I think it's one of those hymns. It's like any Sunday it, w- it would fit in. I, I like the tune of it. I, I like the message to it. It's kind of got like a bit of a chorus in it too. I, yeah. I just, it's uh-huh. a, a solid, it's a solid yeah, hymn. It is. It is solid. I, yeah. I like that. Okay. I remembered my list now. (laughs) Um, Number five for me is it is well with my soul. Mm -hmm. Um, The reason for this is um, uh, I would say a lot of, a lot of um, people already know this story of 
of the um, Horatio Swafford's um, story and, and why he wrote it. Um, so I won't go into that until we get to another him segment. Um, but it just knowing that knowing the story is just is really um, it just makes the text come to life for yeah. me. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so we do number four. Do number four. Uh, okay, so my number four is my hope is built. Okay. Um, and and for maybe a strange reason, I really like the bass line. I always sing the bass line in hymns any chance I can. Yeah. It's just a killer bass line. It I does. Just love the runs. It's anyway. I love. It's a fun one for me to sing. I always. I always leave Sunday like after having sung that hymn with it stuck in my mind for the rest of the day, kind of just playing. Um, it's just, yeah, one of my yeah. favorites. I'm going to play the chorus of that one because it, it, is, it is fun to sing and it is fun to play. Yeah, good choice. Good choice. Just love it. Um, my fourth is a mighty fortress. Hmm. Um, the reason the, um, for me, there has never been a hymn that has been associated with one of the biggest turning points post Jesus rising from the dead. Um, in the church's history, um, that that hymn is direct result of the Reformation. Of right. um, and that minus Jesus rising from the dead um, was, in my opinion, one of the most uh, profound and the most changing points in in church history. Um, mm -hmm. With without without the Reformation, we as Christians um, in in church, the twenty the twenty first century church might not look the same if the Reformation wouldn't have happened. So that's why a mighty fortress is, and it's just a good solid text, and it's a solid uh, tune. I mean, just everything about it is just is just great. Just very like powerful too, yeah. commanding. Yeah. Just, it's, it's like as soon as you hear that, ba, 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 it's just it just like demands your attention. Absolutely. Yeah. Much like Luther probably was in real life too. Just very yeah. Yeah. demanding attention. Um, okay, so for number three, uh, and can it be? Uh, I. Mm, I'm going to be interested to see what your number one is now. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's my number three. Um, solid Charles Wesley hymn. Love that hymn. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God should die for me? Just, I mean, it, you can't get better. I mean, it's, it's just such a great. Yeah. Great hymn. Yeah. Um, number three for me is praise is, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Um, that that hymn, it also just has a demanding feel to it. It just it demands your attention, um, and it's such a great tune. Um, and it, it, there's five five stanzas, and they all begin with praise to the Lord, the Almighty, and then it goes on and it lists reasons for us praising him and and why we praise him and all this so it's it's just a great uplifting and and a good reminder of why we praise god yeah love that him very good all right so my number two is uh this is my song oh god of all the nations okay yeah it, to the tune of Be Still My Soul, it's the same. The Finlandia thing. tune, yeah. Finlandia. Um, I really like this song, uh, particularly for 
for days where we have like Fourth of July, Memorial Day mm-hmm. uh, days, because I think it, it hits two things. It hits love for one's own country and nation, mm-hmm. which I think is great. But on on a second note, I think it's also a great reminder of of the fact that there are other countries out there, mm-hmm. that there are other people out there. Right. And I think that's such a, a great and important message. And and I think the history of this hymn, and I'm like like the Horatio Spafford stuff, I'm mm-hmm. not gonna go deep into that, but I think it was written in Russia during a time where um anyway. So yeah. I, I don't know, I'm a little fuzzy on the history, but I think it's it's a song that really speaks to mm-hmm. the, the fact of there are other people out there. Right. God loves those people too. Yeah. Um, so I just love the I love the message of that hymn. I love the tune to that hymn. Just yeah, yeah. it's a great you can't just and and even be still my soul. I mean that's that's also just and in the tune I think is some of why it's so it just brings the words to life for both of those. Um, for me, for two, for me is um, there's an asterisk beside it because there's <laughs> there's two that are in the number two spot and i'll um it's the church's one foundation um this that hymn um actually was written the the, the tune was written by charles's grandson charles wesley's grandson yeah. samuel wesley wrote that tune aurelia um so there's a little bit of fun fact for that uh but also that hymn just tells the story of the church it tells what the body of christ is supposed to be Um, and then the second part is a hymn called facing a task unfinished Mm -hmm. which is set to the same tune um but it's for me, it's the next four stanzas to the church's one foundation. They just go, they just go together. Um, yeah. Facing a task unfinished is more the missional side of it. Hmm. Um, it was written by a um, a British priest, Anglican priest, um, who later became a bishop in the Anglican Church, and he was over the parishes in China. So he was an Anglican bishop in China and wrote this hymn while he was basically a missionary to China. Um, right now, the Gettys have have re have made it popular again or made it known. So um, I'll actually send you a link of it. So if you want to put it with the podcast or whatever, um, yeah. So- listeners can hear it um because it's just it's just fantastic um so if you want to add a number another number two you can (laughs) (laughs) well you know when you prefaced that i got really nervous because i thought oh no you're gonna pick my number one because similarly i picked a number one that um is known and for um it's the same song, but it's with different tunes. So my number one is all hail the power of Jesus name. Okay. Yeah. But the asterisk is it's the James Ellard uh, version, Eller version, which I, I think is like the, um, I'm trying to think of like how to explain it. It's is the it one in that, the hymnal? It's in the hymnal. Okay. Hold on. I'll get to it. Maybe. I think it's, 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 I think it shows up in the second, it's the second one that shows up. Yeah, the, um. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's it. I love that. And again, I think it's commanding. I think it, I like the words. And also, I love singing that bass line. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great bass line, so. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, and even when, then when you also get 500 people in the same room that know how to sing that hymn, it's just, it, 
brings it alive. It, you can get the men going, crown him, crown him. Yeah. And, and then when the ladies come around and do it the second time and the bases are going down and they're going up, it's, it's a lot of fun to play and it's a, really a lot of fun to sing. Um, that's, that's, a good, that's a good choice. Um, it was that it'll be it's on my top 10. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. so for me, and can it be is number one? Um, uh, just because it's it's like it's the Methodist hymn and it's it's the Christian, it's our story. Um, it, it just it's just who we are as Christians. That's that is our story in singable form. Yeah. Um, and really, I just don't think that you can get any better text wise as far as that hymn. Um, when I was thinking about this and I was uh, talking with my with my dad about it, we'd come to the conclusion that we need different categories. We can't have just a top five yeah. favorite hymns. It has to be, well, we have to have the top five Christmas hymns. We have to have the top right. five meditative hymns. We have to have the top five Jesus, hymns about Jesus, the top five hymns about the Holy Spirit, the top five about yeah. God. and and Because um, you just start naming off, you know, holy, 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 uh, breathe on me, breath of God. Um, rejoice the Lord is King, which is another great Charles uh, tune text. Um, and I mean, there's just so much good theology in yeah. these hymns that um, that we just need to we need to know. And we um, and if when we when we do learn it, then we will we'll sing it even better. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. I mean, it's kind of a fool's errand to try to to pinpoint just five overall because yeah. there's just so much out there. There is so much, and I think I think we did. I mean, we only had one overlapping song. Uh, that's pretty. pretty uh, yeah, I mean, if I had I had started, I was like, I've got to have a Christmas him in there because it's just it's just we just I just have to have one. Yeah. If for my what originally my top my my number five one was We Three Kings. <laughs> <laughs> um just because that's that's also a hymn that just straight up just tells the story. Yeah. Through the through the lenses of the of the wise men. It's great. It is. Yeah. I, I love those hymns that that are theologically rich that help to tell the story that that teach folks i I mean like you said there's just so so much good theology out there so this has been really fun i really appreciate yeah i can't wait for the for the next one yeah absolutely absolutely any any last words as we end the interview um just Take your hymnals home, but ask your pastor first. If you can <laughs> ask your pastor or your or your music leader first, if you can take the hymnal home so you can study it mm-hmm. and then go forth and study the hymns. <laughs> Love it. Thanks, man. Yeah, I really appreciate this opportunity to be on here with you. It's it's been fun. I've enjoyed thinking about what I was gonna say and even though i might not have said anything that i had planned on saying but um here we are we're just letting the spirit move i love it thanks man yeah thanks thank you for listening to this episode of the methodical methodist podcast if you have enjoyed this show i hope you might consider heading on over to itunes to subscribe rate and leave a review of the show it is very much appreciated and until next time Stay methodical.